Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you part three of our Sony A7R Mark IV review. And so if you've missed previous episodes, I have done an overview of the feature set and ergonomic changes between the A7R Mark III and the A7R Mark IV. So if you missed that episode, take a look at that. In a secondary episode, we took a very detailed look at the sensor performance between these two cameras and looked at how they compared in various metrics such as high ISO performance, um, things like dynamic range, and then also when it comes to the resolution and the color science and how the two equal out in all of those areas. And so if you want a detailed analysis of that, I recommend that you look at, take a look at this video. Today, however, we're here to take a look at the autofocus performance. And while I think maybe the headline has been the upgrade to a 61 megapixel uh, sensor, which by the way, from your feedback, as well as my own impressions, is actually maybe the most controversial thing about the A7R Mark IV. And that while there are a small number of people who have said they absolutely need 61 megapixels, they're thrilled to have it. A lot of you have said, eh, I wish I could get all of the upgrades, uh, other upgrades, you know, and maintain a similar resolution to the A7R Mark II and III. And so, um, you know, that's been kind of the marketing hype, you know, because it sets a new bar for uh, the amount of resolution you can have on a 35 millimeter full frame sensor. But in this case, some of the other attributes of the camera are actually maybe more notable. In that first episode, we noted the a lot of ergonomic improvements, and it has made the A7R Mark IV definitely a more usable everyday camera and that just the feel and the positioning of everything you can see that Sony is fine-tuning some of the details there and um, you know and even compared to the Sony a9 um, you know there's there's even a progression there in you know the kind of depth and the travel of buttons that just feel so much better and easier to ergonomically use on the a7r mark 9 or mark 4 um, which, by the way, I'm sure will be one of the notable, although I haven't handled one yet, but one of the notable improvements also to the, A the A9 Mark II is some of those ergonomic improvements. But another one of the features that's not getting maybe as much hype but is very real as an improvement is the autofocus system in the A7R Mark IV. So to give you a basic breakdown of the specs, and then we'll start jumping into actually looking at performance. So when we look at the A7R Mark III, it has 399 uh, phase detect points. It covers about 68% of the sensor area. Um, all of these cameras have 425 contrast AF points. Understand the way that Sony's hybrid AF works is that the preferred method is phase detect basically supported by contrast. And, uh, and so um, they all have kind of the standard for a while has been the 425 contrast AF points because that really isn't the headline feature here. That's more of the support group to help to get very good autofocus and a number of different metrics. And so we go from 399 points on the A7R 3 to 567 points on the A7R Mark IV. And so that jumps from 68% coverage to 87% coverage almost all the height is covered and you know 70 something percent I think 74 percent of the width is covered now moving all the way up is to the Sony a9 which actually has 693 AF points with 93 percent sensor coverage which by the way the a7 III as well um, has a very similar AF system um, to the a9 kind of surprising but they gave kind of the full um, you know the, the full pop of the AF system in the a7 III three, uh, as we'll see kind of the area where it falls off maybe is when it comes to the, um, you know, the buffer depth. And so it's not as competitive there. And so as noted, all three have 425 contrast AF points. Now in the A7R Mark III, if we're looking at the amount of RAWs that you can buffer before it starts to slow down, and so you've got basically 10 frames per second up to 76 RAW, and that's compressed raw, not uncompressed raw. If you want to talk about all these figures that I'm giving, these are for compressed raw. If you want the uncompressed raw figure, basically divide that in half. And that's pretty close to uh, what you get. So 76, um, and that's also 76 JPEGs as well. There's no variance between the raw and the JPEG. They've kind of throttled it at a certain point and that's what it is. Now, actually on the A7R Mark III, the buffer depth drops a little bit. 
and you know your first reaction might be a you know disappointment from that because you go from 76 compressed raw or JPEG to 68 compressed raw or JPEG. But of course, the difference here being it's that extra resolution that you're um, having 30 something percent more resolution. I think it's the figures 37 percent off the top of my head. But um, that amount of extra data that is having to flow through that pipeline. So all things considered, they've actually done a really good job with that. But again, the A7R Mark IV in some ways has moved into a little bit more specialized category because of the increased resolution. And frankly, that may be intentional by Sony to help to further differentiate their their models, particularly if we see the A7 IV when it comes out, come out as, you know, maybe a little bit up market in terms of resolution. And I wouldn't be surprised if it moves just a little bit up in terms of price as well, particularly if it inherits some of these features. And so anyway, um, and so we, we see that it's differentiating there. Now, one advantage that this does have, of course, is with that massive resolution, it has something unique that none of these other cameras can match. And that is its ability to have a over 26, 26.1 megapixel crop mode, which actually ends up as being higher resolution what the A9 is, um, which you know, at 24 megapixels. And then 24 megapixels is also the um, resolution of, say, the A6500, which I'm filming on at the moment. And so um, it has the ability to um, obviously have still very high resolution. Then the other advantage is, is that at least if you're shooting JPEGs and you're shooting in APS-C mode, the buffer depth will actually increase, allowing to be a little bit more of a sports-oriented camera. And uh, you can go up to 204 um, JPEG files um, as far as the buffer goes. Now, I haven't purposely tested that deep. That's a lot of frames, but uh, that's what I am led to understand. Now, the A9, of course, has, has always been a more specialized sports-oriented camera, and so it um, allows you to get 241 compressed RAWs, and so obviously probably more than what most people will ever need. And of course, that's at a much lower 24 megapixels, the resolution of the camera. And then if you're shooting JPEGs, it jumps all the way up to 362 um, extra fine JPEGs. And so you can shoot a lot of, of JPEGs. Now, the frame rate of the two R cameras is the same. It's 10 frames per second, and that is a mechanical shutter. Now, the A9 is a little, again, it's more of a specialized tool. And so it actually will give you up to 20 frames per second with a, an electronic shutter. And by the way, that electronic shutter increases the threshold instead of a limit of one eight thousandth of a second, it gives you one thirty two thousandth of a second. And so it can be very, very handy sometimes when shooting with um, wide aperture glass and bright conditions because it gives you more flexibility, uh, more headroom to operate with when it comes to the shutter speed. Uh, surprisingly, it actually drops if you put it into mechanical shutter, which by the way, I, I found that you need to do if you're going to use, say, um, a flash and a remote trigger for a flash that you need to be in mechanical mode for it to trigger. And so if you do that, it drops actually all the way to five frames per second with the mechanical shutter. However, for sports shooting, you're actually going to want to shoot with that electronic shutter because that's part of what allows you to have the no blackout. And it really is impressive when it comes to that. So let's talk a little bit about the performance of each one of these cameras and I'll show you photos as we go. And so what I have done is I have, I've just, I've shot in a variety of situations when it comes to the sports type work. And so I, I did two different things. I shot in one case, I shot with the, uh, the Canon. If a lot of you want to adapt uh, Canon, you know, or third party lenses. This is the Canon 100 to 400 L Mark II. And then it's the Sigma MC 11. And so um, when, using that adapter. So I shot with that. And then I also shot with some native lenses to do uh, comparisons here. And so in the kind of sports type setting, I was shooting inside a gym. And so to give me nice high shutter speeds, I shot at about uh, typically at ISO 6400. And then when I shot at, you know, kind of a wider aperture, putting an 85 millimeter prime on there and shooting at F2, I dropped that, um, ISO value down to 1600 because I could still get really high shutter speeds with the, you know, with the, the glass that sucked in more light, not the, the big zoom. And so uh, what I found with the A7R Mark III is that in many cases it does, it does fairly well if you are, um, if you're tracking lateral action. And of course, you know, uh, it's received the update as the A9 has to allow for full-time IAF tracking, which certainly makes a difference. And you can see that 
you know, it will pick up on the face, it will try to track the eye. And, uh, and so in many cases, it is fairly successful. Now, if you're looking kind of at the fine print, looking at the detail, I found that the, uh, you know, often the focus wasn't as perfect. And I also found that, um, you know, depending on the lens, while there has been improvements due to the, the firmware updates have made a major difference along the way uh, when it comes to adapting third party glass. And so, um, you know, definitely improvements when it comes to that. But out of these cameras, it is the least effective when using third-party glass. So moving on to the A7R Mark IV. A7R Mark IV, just in real-world everyday shooting, I noted a, a huge improvement when it came to adapting third-party glass to where it felt much more natural, uh, much more like using first-party glass. In some cases, it's a little bit noisier in operation because remember, USM-type motors like what Canon has in a lot of its uh, lenses and then, you know, comparable third-party lenses it's not designed like the stepping motors of mirrorless, which are also designed to be really quiet with this type of, you know, particularly using a lot of what Sony calls AFC or continuous autofocus. And so they're a little bit noisier than some of the better, you know, stepping motor or uh, linear motor lenses, but I found the performance to actually be quite good. Now, where I noticed a difference between, I would, you know, up until that point, I would, I would have said that the A7R Mark IV was as good as the A9 when it came to using third-party glass. But there was one final test that I did where I did notice a difference between the two. And that was when I did, you know, what most of you are familiar with, my straight at the camera, a sprinter coming as fast as they can, and the autofocus trying to keep up. So what I found is that the A9, it tracked fairly well in that situation, even with this combination here. In a gym, shooting at ISO 6400, you know, and that gave me a shutter speed of, you know, around one one thousandth of a second, one eight hundredth in that range. And so what I found is that it actually, autofocus did tracking did continue on. It wasn't always perfect, and I don't think it's as good as what you would get with a native lens, but what I found is that it tracked all the way through the sequence. Autofocus kept moving closer to the camera. With both the A7R 3 and R4, that didn't happen. Autofocus, it didn't really try to keep up. It didn't keep moving forward. So if you're tracking lateral movement, maybe bird in flight, you know, the A7R 4 does really good. It also works well with, you know, for example, I then went on to shoot with a, a uh, the Samyang 85mm f1.4. So shooting at f2. And again, the A7R 3 did pretty good in this, um, you know, not perfect. A7R 4 did better yet. And, uh, and so it did a better job of not having any kind of fluctuations, but holding autofocus. Also, as I was just tracking, um, for example, guys taking jump shots and moving laterally quickly in the gym, I found that, you know, the autofocus did a pretty good job with that. Still in a class of its own, however, is the A9 for sports action. Again, it's more of a specialized camera. And, you know, the difference is shown in that it just seems to maybe drive bigger glass a little bit better than what the R4 does. And so it was a little bit better, um, uh, obviously, in the tracking sequences. You could really see all the time the box was on the face. And if an eye was in view, the eye was on there. And I found, for example, in these shots, even if I... I purposely put another shooter in front of me, or not a shooter, but a defender in, in between myself and the, the ball handler. And I found that it kept tracking the face, even if their face became hidden behind the other person. So it did a great job of staying locked on to a subject. And so um, just it's the overall best performance for sporting action uh, when it comes to that. And so um, if you're trying to decide between these, these three cameras, let me just give you a quick wrap up for each one. A7R Mark III, it's amazing how quickly now people are saying that the A7R III's autofocus is garbage, um, you know, because the R4 is out. <laughs> That isn't anywhere close to being true. Um, in fact, I was just reading some articles today that came out at the time that the A7R 3 was, was launched and how at that point, and remember this is before 
uh, Sony rolled out the firmware updates that have further tweaked autofocus, given us things like full-time AF or IAF, full-time tracking and video. Uh, they were saying that the autofo autofocus system was nearly perfect, and it was revolutionary compared to the uh, the R2, and and it still remains very very competent. If you know you're not shooting fast action all the time, but you're primarily just doing general purpose shooting, which has a mix of anything. I still think that the autofocus system is going to be good enough for you in most situations. Now, if you want to do a lot of glass adapting, and that's kind of a priority to you, you might want to consider either the A7 III or the R4 because it is notably improve, uh, improved when using non-native uh, glass. You know, and when I say third party, I'm not talking about you know Tamron or Sigma lenses designed for Sony. Those work you know, basically like first party lenses, but I'm talking about like Canon lenses or Sigmor and Tamron lenses for, you know, that were designed for Canon EF. And so uh, definitely a notable improvement when it comes to that. The R4 is actually a really well-rounded camera, and I think it will be really attractive to wildlife shooters um, because of that crop mode that really gives you the, the flexibility of um, you know, having a great sensor, but then also having a little bit of added resolution, plus all of the ergonomics that come along with this camera. You still get lots of phase detect points on the sensor in APS-C mode, and so it's really, really appealing for that. If you are an all-out sports shooter, um, right now the A9, the original A9, becomes a really attractive uh, bargain to you because of dropping prices. And it's by the way, it's the only reason why I now have one. I bought a used one, but why it's now in my kit is that because um, you know, particularly if I'm strongly considering the R4, I don't want to be shooting at 61 megapixels all the time because frankly, I don't even need 42 all the time. And so for shooting events and shooting sports the 24 megapixels of the A7, or excuse me, the A9, continue to be really attractive. And it still is top of the heap autofocus. And at this point, it, it might be more attractive as compared to the A7 III, um, which you know has been kind of the bargain place to go if you want a camera for that, for the simple reason that it has a better viewfinder, has the similar viewfinder to the A7R Mark III, which is much better than the A7III's. It's got deeper buffer depth, um, and you know I, I would say that you know even as far as the the color that comes out of this, it's just it's tuned a little bit more for sports action and uh, under you know varying lights, and so I think it's it's still the the camera to choose if your budget doesn't extend all the way to the A9 II. And so um, hopefully that will help you in making your choice. So, I mean, big improvements to the A7R Mark IV when it comes to that front. It's just, you know, the A7R III was, was good. The R4 is better, and it's a very, very competent camera when it comes to autofocus. I have now shot probably at least a dozen different lenses on it. And, uh, and I have been very impressed in every situation. I mean, I've gotten just really good autofocus when I shoot portraits. IAF is just nailed. Um, Pet AF is great. It's better for face tracking and video. I'm very familiar with the A7R3's autofocus performance at this point, And the R4's autofocus is notably improved. In fact, I would go, I would easily say that I notice more of an improvement on the autofocus performance than I do on the sensor performance from the R4. And so um, they've, they've done a great job with that. Stay tuned and I will be back for my final verdict on the um, A7R Mark IV. I will have a video that I'll first share with my patrons that will just show you a lot of photos with varying lenses. I noted at this point I've shot on it with a lot of different lenses and so I will be sharing that with my patrons and uh, giving them a look at that and I possibly will share that to the general public in the future but I'll have to decide on that. At the same time, I, though I will be covering a lot of things in that final episode and I'll look a little bit more at video performance. I'll also take a, a little bit uh, closer look at you know, how the resolution impacts various lenses. And so, you know, to try to, um, you know, maybe set your mind at ease or to help you at least when it comes to that. And so stay tuned for all of that. And I'll be back shortly with it. In the meantime, take a look in the image or in the description down below for the linkage to the image gallery. There's lots of photos there now at this point. And so we'll give you some nice feedback on the performance, the color science of the camera. Also, you can find linkage there if you'd like to purchase one. There's also linkage there to follow 
follow me on social media or you could sign up to become uh, one of those patrons and so you can get advanced looks at things and some additional content. You can also sign up for my newsletter and if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.